Welcome to the HIV podcast. Each week we focus on a person, historical event or pop culture moment linked to HIV and explore the story of what actually happened. I'm Sarah. And I'm Jess. And between us, we've been working in the field of HIV for 40 years. Our aim is to get as many people as possible HIV educated. Welcome to the HIV podcast. It's nice to see you. People listening won't know, but I know you've been on holiday. I have been on holiday. Was it I feel like I'm always on holiday. It's all right. It's just the life I lead. lead I lead. I leave. <laughs> I can't speak. And it's while my you're first a... day back. Yeah, it's too much. This is like like your first, literally your first thing that you're doing back. Um, mm. You were just telling me that you adopted, you've become like a mother goose. Mother duck. A mother, d- so they were ducks. They you're were a mother duck ducker. Things. So on holiday, uh, in the place that we were staying, there was a, a, a lake. And there was a mother duck and all her ducklings, five little ducklings. Oh, so cute. And you were very protective, weren't you? Well, I just felt responsible. They were very near our accommodation. I wanted them to be, you know, she was a very good mum. She needed a bit of support. I just felt like she never totally kept them all in check. Oh, bless. You were there helping. My holiday was literally spent days just counting all the ducklings, making sure they're all there. Oh, really? How many were there? There's only five. Oh, bless. But they all, how ducks do this, I don't know, because she'd be walking along and they'd just go off in different directions. And I'd be like, keep a track of them. Were you there behind them, shooing them? Yes. <laughs> like herding them together. Come on, stay together. Yes. And then that each night stressful. she would settle them in the nest. Well, I call it a nest, rather generous. Just some leaves that she'd flattened. And then I'd be like, oh, good. they've all gone to bed. Then people, because we weren't the only ones staying, obviously, uh, on the kind of like resort thing where we were, uh, other people would spot them and come over to have a look. And I'd be like, no, thank you. No, I've just settled them for the night. No, no looky lose here. Thank you very much. Off you Not go. Not till the morning. <laughs> come back tomorrow, please. Ruining other people's holidays, you were. You're just like, no, <laughs> look away. This isn't for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So what should have been a relaxing holiday actually held a lot of responsibility. Yeah, I was going to say, you, and you, you sort of found that for yourself, didn't you? You were like, no relaxing for me. Mothering instinct is strong. Yes. Um. Right, today, first of all, I would like to give a massive shout out. Don't worry, because I know you hate it when I bang on about the awards. This is about awards, <laughs> but it's not necessarily our award, even though I don't know if everyone knows we are shortlisted for a British Podcast Award and Wellbeing category. I thought like, hi, crowbar that in. I would like to give a massive, massive shout out to friend of the podcast, Dr. Kate Lister, and Betwixt the Sheets, her podcast, because they are currently, well, they, the podcast, Betwixt the Sheets, is currently in the top 20 listeners' choice podcasts for the British Podcast Awards, and that is public voting. So that is no mean feat to be in the top 20 for that. So that we all sense. need to vote. Yes, vote, vote, vote. I have to say, you can't vote for us because I didn't put us forward for that. Only because I thought, while I love people's voting, I'm not going to be greedy. We're already shortlisted. Don't need to be greedy. Oh, how awesome. Okay, so we've got 800 service users. I ring them individually and make them vote. And they'll be yeah, like, right. Who, who's who's Kate Lister? What's between? So you're like, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Follow I do the not link. believe anyone would say, who is Kate Lister? <laughs> um, but I do have serious news today. Oh. Well, it's not it's not depressing news, but I oh, just, okay. I just thought it was something we should address because we have this platform on this podcast. So this is about MPOX. So obviously everyone will have heard and seen the news, and I know it can feel confusing and scary. And you think, what on earth's happening? Is this COVID Mark II? What's going on? So what I have done is just take a little bit of information from the Terence Higgins Trust briefing, which went out on the 20th. So this may well have been updated by the time you're listening, but I'm sure not a huge amount will change. What THT have said is that they are closely monitoring the outbreak of the new variant of MPOX that has emerged in Central and East Africa. Now, there are multiple known variants of MPOX, and these are referred to as clades, each with different characteristics. And an effective MPOX vaccine already exists and is available to people who meet the criteria set by the UK Health Security Agency. Now, I think what it's confusing, isn't it? There's a lot of information about it. So 
Dave's put some sections which we're going to read through. So how is this MPOX variant different to the previous outbreak? I think that's important to know. So they have said the variant involved in the current outbreak in Central and East Africa, played 1B, seems to be more transmissible and to have a higher mortality rate than the outbreak that started in 2022. It also appears that non-sexual close contact accounts for a higher level of transmission than the previous variant, played 2B. That all makes sense. Are you with me, Sarah? I am. Okay, good. They've said, is it likely, another question they've been asked a lot, is it likely that the current MPOX clade 1B outbreak will reach the UK? And again, just to clarify, obviously all of this information is just UK relevant. So I'm mm. sorry to everyone listening everywhere else. So they have said, we can't say for sure. While the UK HSA say the risk to the UK population is con- is currently considered low, we're keeping the situation under constant review. Given the rapid spread of these cases, it's likely that a case will be detected in the UK. It's important, however, that people recognise that the previous MPOX variant, Clade 2B, is continuing to circulate and be detected in sexual health services. So if you're concerned, please contact your, you know, your local sexual health service or call NHS 111. And I thought the last thing we'd go over is how is MPOX passed on? Because that's probably mm. important, important to go over. So MPOX is passed on through close contact, including during sex. The MPOX variant present in the UK since 2022, clade 2B, has mostly been passed on during sex. And the vast majority of cases have been in gay and bisexual men and other men who have sex with men. The new MPOX variant circulating in Central and East Africa, Clade 1B, appears to be primarily transmitted through close contact during sex and may also be easily passed on through household contact. Now, I know that was all a lot of information. I hope some of it was helpful. Um, But as I said, so that's THT's briefing. And they have also said, um, we'll put the link below for the full statement so you can go and read much more information on there. And if you have any questions or concerns, they have said you can call THT Direct on 0808 802 1221 or email them at info at tht.org.uk. Really, what we need to say to everyone is just to be really vigilant. And if you have any symptoms, just get them checked out. I think the symptoms for M for MPOX are quite generic, aren't they? We've had this last time when it was in the UK and we had so many questions. Yeah. And so many people worried. But um, yeah, you can go and find out all the information you need. That's it. Have Go and have a look online, because obviously one of the symptoms is a rash. And if we just say a rash, then anyone that has any kind of rash will just freak out. So it's good to um, go and just have a look because it's a different kind of rash. You can see pictures and things like that. But as Sarah said, you know, just be vigilant. Keep an eye out. If you're concerned, we've given you information of who you can contact. Um, So, yeah, there you go. Well, information service today. Excellent. Thank you very much. You are welcome. What are we on? Denial three. No, we're not. Oh, God. Am I going to get old? Yes. We're looking at denial. It's my denial mini series. I'm cutting you out. <laughs> yeah, but I edit this. So I believe in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Oh, we, aren't we looking at someone that was in denial today? Yes. Yes. So we've looked at the stages of HIV acceptance. We've looked at what happens when you're stuck in the denial stage. And this week we're looking at an HIV and AIDS denier and she set up a whole denial organisation. No, she didn't. I'm joking. I promise. That's the last one. Swear that's the last one. Okay. Okay. Don't contribute anymore. I can do this on my own. I'll just nod, smile and nod. (laughs) I don't need any input. (laughs) Noted. (laughs) So the organisation was called Alive and Well AIDS Alternatives, and it was founded by someone called Christine Majori. And she was HIV positive herself. And she didn't deny that HIV existed, but she questioned the link between HIV and AIDS. She also questioned the accuracy of HIV tests and the efficacy of HIV medication. So she's not really fully on board with any of it. Absolutely not, yeah. She was diagnosed in 1992 and initially she became involved in AIDS activism. So we know there was a huge amount of stigma, very little knowledge at that time. But she became sceptical about the established views on HIV and AIDS, so much so that she started to advocate against the use of HIV medication. And she believed in it so strongly that not only didn't she take the medication herself, but she also denied them to her daughter because she believed that HIV was harmless. 
surely that's a crime. Well, we will come on to that later. Oh, 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 I look, see, you can you can tell I watch a lot of Law and Order. Is it like CSI? Yes. And what where did CSI go? I don't know. There were a million, weren't there? And then now we're just not seeing them. Yeah, in different cities. Mm. And to be fair, they it, it was quite a good TV series. A bit gory for me sometimes, but oh, I liked it. Okay. Anyway, we'll go back to the beginning. As always, so Christine, well-educated, high-paying job, well-travelled. By the late 80s, she's working for an international clothing company. Oh, that would be my dream next, if you're listening. Oh, next is a clothes shop, because that sounded like what you were saying was, that's my next dream. That's the way I took that. But you mean next Oh, no, I mean shop. next as in the clothes shop. Spend enough with them. I deserve something in return. Maybe I should aim it. higher. Let's go for something like Prada. Do you think you love Next the most, though, because they have a catalogue? They don't have a catalogue anymore. How do you buy things? Online. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like Next the most because it's delivered to your door. And if you're not happy, they just come and pick it up again. Now, I know other clothing companies do that too, but Next does it the best. Okay. Okay. And if they'd like to sponsor the HIV podcast, and why wouldn't they? Just get in touch with us. Anyway, back to Christine. So she was diagnosed with HIV during a routine medical examination in 1992. She starts to volunteer for various HIV charities. Uh, you know, she wants to make a difference. Lots of people do that, actually, don't they, after they're mm. diagnosed? And I applaud all of them. So, so far, so good. Until she met someone called Peter Duesberg. He's a German American molecular biologist and a professor of molecular and cell biology at the University of California. And he's known for his research into the genetic aspects of cancer. He also advocated the theory that HIV didn't cause AIDS. Got a whole episode coming up on him because it is, it's fascinating and also a bit balmy. Uh, anyway, he shared his views with Christine. They met at an event and understandably, I think, she changed her view of HIV. I mean, he's an academic, a scientist. What's not to trust? Yeah, that, that is true, especially at a time when there's a lot less information. Exactly. You're going to go, people like that are held in high esteem. Right, we say, you know, they're very knowledgeable. He's telling her this and she believes him. And she changes her views quite profoundly. So she started to believe that her own positive test was the result of, um, initially she thought it was the result of the flu vaccination. Then she thought, well, actually, maybe it was because um, I've been pregnant. Then she said, well, I could have had a viral infection at the time. We should point out none of those things affect an HIV result back then or now. But back then, of course, there was less information, wasn't there? Yeah, of course. So I think it was easier to draw your own conclusions. So in 1995, she set up Alive and Well AIDS Alternatives. The organisation denied there was a link between HIV and AIDS and urged pregnant HIV positive women to avoid meds, HIV meds, for themselves and their children. Oh, no. No. I, I know. Uh, she was an exhibitor at the 13th International AIDS Conference, which was held in Durban in South Africa in 2000, promoting her organisation and believes that AIDS is not a thing. I know that sounds absolutely bonkers because it's an AIDS conference, but we'll do an episode on South Africa too. My so we goodness. understand more about their stance and why this was allowed to happen. Right, okay. Uh, and then in 2001, she has a daughter. She already has a son who's negative as far as, as we know. It's never mentioned that he was positive too. But her daughter was born HIV positive. Uh, and by this point, it's not it's not just HIV and AIDS that she's questioning. So she wrote an article in 2002 called My Bout of So-Called AIDS. I can't believe people are allowed to publish this sort of thing, but there you go. And uh, in that article, she wrote that she'd had an abnormal cervical screening. They call it a pap smear in America. Hers had come back as grade three pap smear with cervical dysplasia, which she said qualified her as an AIDS diagnosis. Doctors recommended a colposcopy, the first step to ascertaining the extent of the abnormal pap smear. But Christine chose to go against this advice. She decided to follow a naturopathic program, homeopathic, I suppose we'd call it. Uh, she said she went on to have a normal result from another pap test, which she'd had done under a false name with a different doctor. 
I know. In an LA Times article in 2005, she claimed she's in excellent health. Her husband, who's a film producer, was negative, and she said they were having normal latex-free relations. You have that's latex-free. how I. That's how I. Yeah, I'm allergic. That's how you instigate it with Ben. Shall we have normal latex-free relations? Later? I don't. I don't call it normal, Sarah. But I'm like, do you want latex-free relations? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> okay, just latex-free. Yeah, yeah. We're just going latex-free. Yeah. Oh, what a weird way to describe it. I know. Very clinical. Very strange, but she's she, she wants everyone to know she's fine. Her husband's fine. The kid's fine. Everything's going great. So at this point, you might be forgiven for thinking that the health professionals have made a mistake and she's not positive at all until you hear what happened next. Brace yourself. Her daughter, Eliza, as we said, born in 2001, she wasn't tested for HIV Christine didn't take any meds during pregnancy to reduce mother-to-baby transmission. She also breastfed both her children, despite evidence at that time that that's also a transmission route. And she was criticised for these decisions. Because by the way, she's quite a high-profile figure. Um, And she was criticised for the fact that neither child had any of the recommended childhood vaccines. Her response was that Charlie, the son, had tested negative three times and that both children were in good health. In April 2005, little Eliza became ill. Uh, she was diagnosed with pneumonia, but she wasn't tested for HIV. So she's never been tested. When she failed to improve, Christine took her to see a um, holistic practitioner. So she's very into this kind of complementary medicines and homeopathic yeah. medicines. Now, this practitioner was also a board member of Alive and Well, her organisation. Mm. He prescribed amoxicillin because he diagnosed Eliza with an ear infection. What? I know. <laughs> yeah. Also, I mean, if you're a holistic practitioner, would you be prescribing amoxicillin? Like, generic medicines like that? But anyway, he did. Um, Eliza didn't get better. On May the 16th, 2005, she collapsed and she was rushed to hospital where she very sadly died. An autopsy revealed she died of pneumonia. A post-mortem examination showed changes to her brain consistent with encephalitis, which is another common medical condition which is linked to AIDS. The coroner concluded that Eliza had died of pneumonia in the setting of advanced AIDS. That's so sad. Isn't it? I really, I, I actually didn't think that's what you were going to say. I thought the story which she was going to have got very ill and then, you know, this is where we get her proper meds and get her tested and, oh, that's incredibly sad. It's really sad, isn't it? Mm. I mean, Christine, I suppose unsurprisingly, rejected the coroner's conclusion. She had the autopsy reviewed by um, a vet pathologist with a PhD in animal disease pathology. He wasn't a registered doctor. He wasn't board certified in uh, human pathology but she chose to go to him as an expert but to a he... vet just to clarify mm. yes a- as an expert yes veterinary pathologist right okay um he concluded eliza had died from an allergic reaction to amoxicillin and that was all the evidence christine needed to believe that her daughter hadn't died from aids but she took her to a vet like, do you know what I mean? I, and I'm, I'm not trying to like sound like I'm being rude about her or anything, but it's like, come on. You can't be like, yeah, this is all the evidence I need from this specialist vet about my human child. Yes. <clears throat> so this is not even somebody who is um, certified to kind of review human autopsies. It, it's very strange, but I think that's the thing that people go to sometimes, isn't it, to... Well, yeah, exactly. No, I'd agree with you. It's it's literally doing anything not to get because you'd just go to a an actual specialist, wouldn't you? Or in that area. But I think, you know, and especially these days, you can find experts in anything if you want to, to coincide with your views. Look at us, podcast experts. (laughs) HIV experts. Yep. Yeah. I wonder what constitutes being an expert. Is it how long you've worked in the field? Is it your academic um, credentials? I don't know. That, I'm actually going to look that up so that we can find out how to become experts, Sarah, and then call ourselves that. 
Because I wouldn't say we're experts in HIV, but I would say we're experts in HIV support. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Mm. Uh, right. After Eliza's death, there was huge controversy because her death could it could so easily have been prevented. Mm. So John Moore, who was a leading HIV and AIDS researcher, spoke at the 16th International AIDS Conference, using Eliza's death as a concrete example of the harm that results from pseudoscientific beliefs, in particular AIDS denialism, saying infants whose HIV-infected mothers listen to AIDS denialists never get the chance to make their own decisions. But that's true, isn't it? That's what we were saying. You, you can't make that decision for somebody else. Yeah, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because as a mum, with this, well, you've got responsibility for your children, but how far should that responsibility go if you're clearly making the wrong decisions? Mm. Isn't it um, similar with like Jehovah's Witnesses, where oh, they're not allowed blood transfusions? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, it is, and there've been court cases about that. Because I suppose if you're if there was the reasonable um, view that your child could be positive and you're withholding that medication, wouldn't that count as neglect? I would think so, yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, and everybody's saying Eliza's death is unnecessary and, yeah, therefore neglectful. Uh, but Christine, she still stood firm in her beliefs and she received support um, from, from other people who also shared her views. Uh, a journalist called Celia Barber wrote an article alleging incompetence, conspiracy, cover-ups on the part of the coroner, uh, cover-ups on the part of the AIDS community, the mainstream media and the medical community. This is just not helpful, things like this, just not helpful at all, you know? No, but isn't it awful that those things can be printed, that journalists can also have those views and can write about them and get them out on on a wider platform? Anyway, the LA police investigated Eliza's death, along with Child Protective Services, to see if charges could be brought for medical neglect or child endangerment. But the LA District Attorney's Office said charges couldn't be filed because Christine had taken Eliza to several different doctors. Now, some of those doctors were practising homeopathic remedies, but that apparently still counts as seeking advice. Surely you'd have to be a medical professional. Surely that would be just the base level of a requirement for this. Well, I mean, what they did next was the Medical Board of California filed charges of gross negligence against Eliza's paediatrician because when she first took Eliza to that paediatrician, they didn't test her for HIV and they should have done. Yeah, and how different would everything be if she knew that Eliza was positive? The doctor also didn't document her parents' refusal to consent to a test, which again is important. So if you offer it and your parents refuse it, there are things that doctors can do to kind of override that decision because you, they have to act in the best interests of their patient. They also alleged similar violations of standard medical care for a second HIV positive child. Now, they don't mention who that is, but possibly that's the brother. You don't know. So the doctor's name is Dr. Fleiss and having conceded that he hadn't kept adequate records, he was found grossly negligent and sanctioned with 35 months probation. So he was the one that got punished for this. Well, I mean, yes, he should have tested her. But again, we actually don't know the ins and outs and what she said to him and what went on. No, it boils down to him not having recorded it in the notes and not being able to prove. Yeah. That's what happened. So a bit of a scapegoat. Yeah, I'd say so. Christine and her husband sued Los Angeles County in 2007 for violating their daughter's civil rights and privacy by releasing the autopsy report, and they reached a settlement in 2009. Oh, my God. I know. This just continues to be bizarre. It's really bizarre. Now, Christine wouldn't have been aware of that settlement because she died on 27th of December 2008 at the age of 52. She'd... Uh, it's been reported she died from pneumonia. Her death certificate states the cause of death was disseminated herpes virus infection and bilateral pneumonia. Both of those HIV related infections, as we know. Yeah. Her supporters absolutely deny this as her cause of death uh, and say some say she died as a result of 
toxic alternative medicine. Some say she died from stress. Some say she had a cold or flu. But how would they know? You, you can't just make things up and go, but that's how they died. I know. Do you know what? I mean, it's, it's just so sad, isn't it? Yeah. Really sad. You know, at the heart of this is a three-year-old little girl who had absolutely no choice in her healthcare or um, even being tested for HIV. And it's, yeah. it's frightening. And I don't, I mean, I hope that, well, I'm probably naive in saying this because I hope things like this don't happen now. But I think the power of the mind sometimes is quite incredible. You can believe anything you want to believe and you can find facts to back it up anywhere these days, especially now we've got access to the internet. But I think things like this do happen. I think look at what happens in some churches that we are aware of where it's, and I know it, it's a form of denial, I would say. It's that whole, but if you believe in, you know, Jesus Christ or God, then you shouldn't take your meds because mm. they will cure you, you know, or you'll be fine. And that is sort of a form of denial as well. So I think it probably is still happening where people are making those choices because they're put under an awful lot of pressure from churches or the people that we have supported around this. You know, it's... Yes. You would be outcast if you then chose to take your meds, which I'm assuming would mean it would be the same if you gave your children meds, you know? Oh, that's very true. And we've had several people, haven't we, that yeah. we've supported who chose not to take their medication because God would cure them. Yeah. And and didn't. They, they, they sadly passed away. Yeah. But I think it's one of... For me, it's always one of the most frustrating aspects of our... Our job. I don't have that belief. I've never had a belief that strong. No. Um, and it's hard to kind of counteract that with logic because yeah, absolutely that they don't want to hear that. Mm. Many times I've had people say, oh, I'm going to pray for you because you don't have the belief. And it's like, you can pray all you want, mate. It's not going to change the way I feel. Maybe one day we will do a whole thing on HIV and religion. I think there's a lot to unpick there. Oh, I think there's so much and possibly bits that people aren't aware of maybe people aren't aware that churches even in the uk are there are some pastors mm. out there who are preaching and saying don't take your meds do not take them and if you do take them that shows that you don't believe enough yes That's, if you're a very spiritual person that has to be what a difficult thing, you know, someone saying to you, this thing that's going to make you well and healthy, which we're all saying in the clinic, please take this. And then actually they're saying, but if you believed in God, this massive central part of your life, then you wouldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have enough faith because the faith will get you. Yes. Saved. Yeah. 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 You don't believe enough. So you're showing that you don't. And it's like, yeah, we should definitely do an episode on this at, at one point. Because this is happening in this country. We know this is happening in other countries too, but this is happening here. This is happening in our areas. Yeah, no, you're right. We should do. As I always say, it's a complex subject. Yeah, it's a, it's a massive, it's massive it subject. It very much is. And um, yeah, no, we do need to look at that at some point in the future. Add it to the, lo the long scroll list, Sarah, of all of our... Oh my God, talking about which, I'm so excited. Are you ready? Uh, this is impromptu news in the middle of a podcast. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? So on the episode that I did with Zoe and Chantal, where I was updating them a bit more about the International AIDS Conference, we did a little shout out to a porn star. He only got in contact with me. Oh, Literally last Monday morning, I was like, what, how, what does my Monday morning look like at work? Text from a porn star. How cool. Yeah, so Hans Berlin got in touch and I love him so much because he literally, he said, hi, it's Hans Berlin, international porn star. <laughs> And I was like, I want a title like that. That is brilliant. <laughs> We're not born, you know what I mean? What brilliant. It reminds me of like Austin Powers, you know, International Man yeah. of Mystery. It was like oh that. Oh my God, that's how they introduce themselves. Well, that's how Hans does. And he had heard the podcast and said, I've heard you're inviting me to come on the podcast. Oh, I'd love to. Oh. So I'm in talks at the moment, just arranging it, but we might be having a porn star on. Wow. Oh, I look forward to that. So many questions I've got. I know. Very exciting. But sorry, go on. You go on. Well, we are done. That's all we need to know about Christine. Next week, we are going to look. Uh, she had some quite high profile friends and we are going to look at uh, a rock group. A rock group? 
Even just saying that doesn't make me sound cool, does it? People well, probably I, don't call them that anymore. A rock group. Well, we, we'd probably say a band. Rock band. <laughs> Why are you saying right, Next week, we are looking at a band, a, a music band. <laughs> <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> next week, we're looking at a band that was linked to Christine. Oh, wow. Are they famous? Would, would I know yes. who they are? Oh, absolutely. Oh. <gasps> Oh my god! You're not going to tell us. Are we going to wait till next week? This is so exciting. No, I've made such a hash up of that. I can't talk anymore. <laughs> yeah, don't don't ruin it more. Don't ruin it more. <laughs> yeah. it's fine. I've never sounded so middle class. You just sounded like a mum. What's that? Is that that rock music you're listening to? <laughs> That's good, isn't it? <laughs> oh my god! This is terrible. No, this is exciting. So it's all you know. I was going to say it's all porn stars and rock bands. It really is. It, that's our lives porn stars and rock bands thanks for listening to the HIV podcast if you enjoyed our podcast please like rate and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts you can now also follow us on Instagram and TikTok at the HIV podcast for behind the scenes insights and video the HIV podcast is produced by Thames Valley Positive Support